The image of a diminutive man dressed in green, with a top hat, black buckled shoes, a green vest, and a four-leaf clover, has become, for better or worse, part of the global image of Ireland, danced out around St. Patrick's Day as a sanitized cultural symbol of Ireland and its people. And this is done to such a degree, at least in North America, that it can sometimes feel offensive. Often the leprechaun and the four-leaf clover is the only thing most people know about Irish folklore or Ireland in general. Yet for the widespread notoriety of this dwarfish creature, aside from standard tropes of hidden gold and rainbows, not so much is known about it. What is the true identity and origin of this tiny being transformed into a giant globalized brand? What really are leprechauns? Now most people throughout the world have heard of leprechauns. The little men have even invaded China and are frequently used as a symbol of Ireland by people around the world. This seems to have begun as early as the mid-1800s, with the intentional dissemination of Gaelic folklore in the Americas. In late Irish folklore, the leprechaun was a much larger player than his size would suggest, and it was in this late stage within the 19th century that he developed his stereotypical appearance with his vest, buckled shoes, top hat. The style of clothing they are ascribed is down to the age in which the appearance was formulated, where writers or storytellers pictured them wearing clothing that was somewhat outdated, but more or less contemporary. Older legends feature descriptions of medieval-style clothing, and so these particular details about the leprechaun can be dated within the modern period, but the leprechaun himself is far older. In the folklore, leprechauns are depicted as generally solitary pranksters, working on shoes and sometimes even being helpful to men. Though they often get up to mischief, it is not of the same order or kind as the fairies or the Dunashi, who are very often dangerous and sometimes lethal. Contrary to their depictions in the 20th century, Earlier conceptions of the leprechaun were fairly consistent that he wore red. The color red may also connect him to the underworld, and with another similar creature, the Ferderg, the Red Man. William Allingham, born in 1824, wrote an interesting poem about the little fellows, part of which reads, Tip tap, rip rap, tick attack too. Scarlet leather sewn together, this will make a shoe. Left, right, pull it tight, summer days are warm. Underground in winter, laughing at the storm. Lay your ear close to the hill, do you not catch the tiny clamor? Busy click of an elfin hammer. Voice of the leprechaun singing shrill, as he merrily plies his trade. He's a span and a quarter in height. Get him in sight, hold him tight, and you're a made man. He was said to be the only truly industrious fairy, who was wealthy for all the shoes he would make, and his gold would be hoarded beneath the earth. If the leprechaun favored a person or family, he might help with the work, or he might willingly guide a person to their fortune. Failing this favor, the leprechaun could be caught and in exchange for his life, he will grant his wealth. These details are more illustrative of the nature of the pre-Christian role of the leprechaun than might be assumed. The first known appearance in Irish myth of the leprechaun is to be found in the Shanhas Moor law book, which references a tale about Fergus MacLetty, and it is possible that this tale is an origin as old as the 9th century perhaps even older. The legendary king falls asleep near the sea and wakes to find himself being dragged into the ocean by several diminutive figures. 
identified as Lucorpan. He catches them in his hand before they can drag him in, and they beg for their lives. Fergus demands his three wishes from them in exchange for their lives. The idea of obtaining wishes from someone captured is not specific to leprechauns originally, but was a general practice that shows up in many tales. If a person holds an enemy's life in their hands, three wishes or demands can be made of them in exchange for their life. Fergus seeks from the Lucorpan the means to travel underwater, and they provide him with, depending on the version, either a hood, magic herbs, or magic shoes, which allow him to pass over and under the water. They then bring him to their abode beneath the sea where he spends days with them. He is warned by them not to go beneath a particular lake, but after a while he ignores the warning, ending up disfigured from the sight of a terrible monster, which causes his mouth to move to the side of his face. In the later versions of this tale, the leprechauns are said to be smaller than dwarves, so small that they could stand on the hand of a dwarf. A humorous tale is told of how Essert, a leprechaun, dared to inform the king of the leprechauns, Yuvdan, that there were men in Ireland bigger and stronger than they. He goes to meet Fergus MacLetty to prove it, and returns with a dwarf from his court, which seemed like a giant to the leprechauns who were terrified of his size and strength. In this tale, Fergus ends up capturing the leprechaun king, who is shown to be extremely knowledgeable and not unfair. The leprechauns threaten to take the milk from the cows, to burn down the mills, to dirty the water, and to snip the ears from the corn if their king is not freed. Yet the only threat that frightens Fergus is the threat that the leprechauns will shave everyone's head bald. Finally, wishing to avoid conflict, Yuvdan, the king of the leprechauns, offers Fergus his treasures, saying, Take my spear, oh take my spear, Fergus, that has enemies in number. In battle it is a match for a hundred, and a king that holds it will have fortune among hostile spear points. Oh take my belt, gold and silver appertain to knowledge of it. Sickness will not lay hold on him that is encircled by it, nor on skin encompassed by my girdle. My cauldron, a special rare thing, though they were stones that should go into my cauldron, yet would it turn out meat befitting princes. He goes on to list a powerful sword, a shirt that fits anyone, a timpan, a needle, sheep that are eaten and revive the next day like the goats of Thor, his horse rod, and his magic shoes that take one over land and sea. This list is effectively a list of all the magical items in possession of the various gods. Lug, for instance, was said to have the reviving goats as well as the spear, and the cauldron appears to be very similar to the cauldron of the Dagda. But this isn't the first time in myth that we see an offer like this with such a list of items. In a story about Cúhollin, he is at the edge of the River Boyne, and he sees a tiny bronze boat moving down the river, without the power of oars or a sail. A small dwarf is in the boat, which he takes up in his hand. The dwarf is identified as Shenvek, little old one. And in one version, it also gives his name as Avkan, meaning dwarf. And this is the same Avkan who served as bard of Luglavada. The dwarf offers Cúhollin his cloak and shirt, which fit anyone and protects from drowning, burning, and old age, and his shield and spear that will ensure him victory in battle. But then Cúhollin notices he has a little harp, and Shenvek offers to play it for him, and he plays the three magical strands on the harp, which cause joy, sorrow, and sleep. When Cúhollin succumbs to the magic, the dwarf escapes with a laugh. Though not called a leprechaun, Avkan's nature and offer of magical items after being caught is identical to that of the leprechaun in later stories. He is likewise associated with water and the sea. 
In another tale of Avgan, he brings a woman across the ocean from the other world, only for her to fall into the water and drown. Recall that the home of the leprechauns, in the earliest recorded source, is under the sea, and they attempt to drag Fergus beneath the sea, and grant him power to go under the water. This is representative of the power to travel between worlds, the underworld existing beneath the land and the water. So what does the name Leprechaun itself mean? Early modern writers sometimes took the name to be derived from Lu meaning small and Kor meaning body. However, a recent extensive study of the Old Irish language by scholars from Cambridge and Queen's University Belfast have found that the word is very likely borrowed from Latin, from a very unexpected source. Every February 15th in Rome, there was a festival called the Lupercalia. A group of young men served as priests called Luperci, and they would gather at the Lupercal Cave at the base of the Palatine Hill in Rome, where Romulus and Remus were said to have been suckled by a she-wolf. There they make a sacrifice of a goat, and then make a thong of the flayed goat hide, and run naked through the streets of central Rome, circling the Palatine Hill, striking those that they come across with the thong, being struck by the thong was thought to be good luck and bring fertility, and it was said that women would sometimes purposely line up in order to be hit by these men. Even after the banning of paganism in Rome, there is proof that the celebration continued at least a hundred years later, for in 494 AD the Pope denounced the practice. The Senate apparently resisted the move saying that it was vital to Rome's safety and well-being and were promptly mocked by the Pope Gelasius, and told to go run naked through the streets themselves then. What might any of this have to do with leprechauns? The Lupercalia was thought associated with Pan, or a local Roman manifestation of a similar deity. The name likely derives from lupus, wolf, but it's unlikely that this connection has anything to do with the leprechaun origin. More likely is that the early Irish Christians saw a similarity between this luck-bringing, fertility-bringing festival and the character of the leprechauns, who originally may simply have been a type of dwarf, or more specifically a subterranean but largely beneficent spirit which helps bring prosperity and fertility. There are many other such creatures known in other European folklore, and often they are represented as having a diminutive size and are solitary in nature. In some medieval sources, the Lucorpans show up as another name for Fomoirians. As I have discussed in a video on the Fomoirians, their name likely relates to Beneath the Sea, which is where our earliest tale of the Lucorpan and Fergus place them. But it's doubtful that in origin they were the same as the Fomoirians, but they are both likely associated with productive forces and the earth. The leprechaun is a figure who appears on the very individualized level, potentially bringing luck or wealth to the deserving or witty. His tendency towards shoemaking in later folklore may relate to his ability to travel or his tricky nature. In later versions of Fergus MacLetty, the leprechaun gives him magical shoes to be able to travel across the sea and land, and even beneath the water. Eventually they become represented as cobblers, but there is no idea of this in the earliest sources, though they are connected with magical items including shoes. It could also relate to a fairly common belief that the shoemaker is a tricky fellow. In Aesop's fables, there is a story told of Hermes. Zeus ordered Hermes to instill a dose of deceit in every craftsman. With a pestle and mortar, Hermes ground the drug into a fine powder, and after dividing it into equal portions, he began to apply it to each of the craftsmen. In the end, only the cobbler was left, 
and a great deal of the drug was still left over. So Hermes poured the entire contents of the mortar onto the cobbler. As a result, all craftsmen are liars, but cobblers are the worst of all. The tricky nature of the cobbler is upheld in Welshmith, where Gwydion, a British god equated with Mercury, helps Say to acquire his name by disguising themselves as shoemakers to catch his mother Arnhrod off guard. Some have taken this example as evidence that Say is also Mercury and that the leprechauns are associated with shoes because they are a folklore version of the god Lug and then try to connect the name Lug to the name Lug Korpan. Yet it is true that the leprechaun does have some similar features to the god Mercury, who is likewise related to Pan, possibly even originating as different names for the same god, as Pan comes from the Proto-Indo-European deity of the flocks and fields. Indeed, the leprechaun is seldom seen closer to the house and the garden, and is normally encountered out of doors, alongside fields or beneath trees. Now this brings us back to the notion that in a very early period, they were given a name borrowed from Latin to refer to a festival of fertility and good luck, the Lupercalia. Recall the line from the poem by William Allingham. Summer days are warm, underground in winter, laughing at the storm. It supports a notion of seasonality of the leprechaun as a being out and about during summer, but residing in the underworld in winter. And there is a similar thing said about the Arcadian Finfolk who live beneath the sea during the winter. This would likewise link them to the fertility of the land, and perhaps why they become associated so strongly with buried treasure. As spirits that take up residence in the land, they likewise possess the wealth contained in it, which perhaps relates again to the Fomorians, from whom the harvest must be won. To get the wealth, one must overcome its guardians. But in Irish myth, rather than a dragon guarding the gold, it's a leprechaun, who defeats the hopeful hero not with fire, but with tricks. Allingham says, Nine and ninety treasure crocks, this keen miser fairy hath, hid in mountains, woods, and rocks, ruin and round towers, cave and wrath, and where the cormorants build from times of old, guarded by him, each of them filled full to the brim with gold. There are many stories collected in the 19th century which attest to people having dreams of buried treasure and going out to these old places in search of it, and sometimes they claim to have actually found this treasure. These stories likely have a basis in reality, because many items of value were buried for thousands of years and are still sometimes stumbled upon by farmers in fields today who uncover old unknown grave sites. Nobody can say for sure how many priceless cultural artifacts were dug up in the early modern period by such treasure seekers and sold for a tiny fraction of their true value or melted down. We know of a few lost artifacts, such as the Urnfield Culture Gold Hat, which was taken to France and then disappeared, perhaps either stolen or sold, without wanting to admit it, but likely there were many other things plundered. There is even tales of this plundering in old Irish stories where the chain of Lube was said to have been dug up from the mound of a giant in the presence of St. Patrick. In the same poem, Allingham goes further to connect the leprechauns with fertility, saying, How would you like to roll in your carriage? Look for a duchess's daughter in marriage. Seize the shoemaker, then you may. Big boots a-hunting, sandals in the hall. White for a wedding feast, pink for a ball. This the way, that the way. The first usage of the name Leprechaun in English was from a comedy published in 1604 called The Honest Whore, where it says, As for your Irish Lubricon, that spirit, whom by preposterous charms thy lust hath raised, in a wrong circle, 
Clearly then, the Leprechaun's powers were originally beyond the scope preserved in modern fairy tales of rainbows and pots of gold. Though the gold element is early, the rainbow element appears to be very modern, so that even folk tales in the 19th century do not mention this. If they were connected to this power of fertility, it also supports the connection to the Lupercalia. This feature may have also been part of the identity of the dwarf god Avgan, the bard of Lu. He sailed the goddess Ruith across the sea, as she desired to seduce Aeth Shronmar, meaning Big Nose. He was also said to have violated the goddess Edain, for which Angus MacOg killed him, and these tales do seem to connect him back to fertility in some fashion. So in origin, the Leprechaun was very likely a spirit who was related to fertility and luck, and this was the basis for acquiring the name from the Luperkey, who ran wild and naked through the streets, bestowing fertility and luck. Their activities may have been seasonal, following the fertile earth, living beneath the earth or sea during the winter, and emerging with the grass of spring. They act also as guardians of the wealth possessed by the land, which they try to hoard, a source of wealth that could be obtained by those who were exceptionally clever, which may relate to the shrewdness required to acquire wealth generally. In early modern folklore, they are non-violent spirits, with their tricks seldom ending in anything but embarrassment. Their nature may have been slightly sterner in archaic times, as their association with the Fomoirians in some sources suggest, and other related creatures like the Ferdero can cause nightmares. Their first recorded appearance seemed to suggest that they tried to drown Fergus MacLetty. Whatever the case, they are spirits of production, and they open up the possibility of great wealth for the crafty, and tricks for the dim-witted. The wealth possessed in the land is watched over by them, and their fairy shoes they constantly forge have the power to cross between our world and the world of the spirits, sometimes represented as being beneath the earth and at other times being beneath the water. They bring fertility and luck from the other world, perhaps without the need to get slapped by a goat thong by a Luperkey priest. Well, I hope you liked the video, and if you did, you'll consider supporting me through Patreon or PayPal. Don't forget to like and subscribe, and as always, stand tall.